All right. Um, so um, a few administrative things before we get started. Um, about half of you um, have received your clinical assignments um, by email um, with comments on them. The comments are as tracked change, change comments, which means that if you don't um, download, if you just try to look at the document in preview, you won't see the comments. So you need to download it to see the comments. Um, the grades are there. Um, the rest of you will get those um, this afternoon. And I'm, I'm grading, grading, grading. Um, you also received some um, data for the adaptive immune assignment. You got the absorbances from the MTS assay. Um, you did each of your conditions in duplicates. So you have eight conditions, each with duplicate uh, readings. Um, the, it asks you for a graph. Basically, you want to have a graph that looks something like that. So you've got eight conditions. There should be like eight bars. Just do the average. You don't have to do, of, of the duplicate, you don't have to do like a standard error or anything. Just average the duplicate, make a bar. And so you've got four cell types, each with and without beads. So do your four different cell types, with, without beads, absorbance. That's all that graph has to be. Don't stress about it. Um, and I will see you guys tomorrow uh, in lab um, to work through the lab practical, um, which I am uh, hoping will be relatively straightforward. Not about stress right now. Um, and yeah, you guys will be seeing lots more um, info and emails from me as we are finishing up the semester. You also have a doodle poll um, for possible times for a review session for the final. Um, so make sure that you respond to that before Friday's class so that I can tell you when the review session will be uh, during class on Friday. Today, we're going to talk about cancer immunology. Um, I'm first going to just talk a little bit about some general cancer biology. And that is largely so that we are all on the same page about cancer biology as I move into thinking about cancer immunology. Um, and then we will start to think about why in the world I am talking about cancer in an immunology class. Um, and there is much to be said about that. But again, I want to start by hitting a couple of key points about cancer biology um, so that we're all on the same page to use that information uh, elsewhere in the uh, discussion. Um, so one really key piece of thinking about cancer is mutation, of course. Um, sometimes I think that um, you guys have a little bit of an oversimplified thought about mutation um, from some past courses. Um, but mutation is involved in cancer progression. It is not always going to lead to cancer progression. You need to have a mutation that influences things like cell division or cell death. At some point in time, one of my ancestors had a mutation relative to other early humans that made their eyes go from brown to blue or early humans had brown eyes. Some, at some point, one of my ancestors had a mutation that led to me having blue eyes. Just because that was a mutation doesn't mean I have cancer. It, so it's not every mutation leads to cancer, but it's mutations that are influencing certain processes, like division and death processes, that processes that can influence the cell's homeostasis. So yes, cells can undergo mutations following exposure to mutagens or just because polymerases make mistakes sometimes. One thing that can happen when 
cells acquire mutations is that those cells can become transformed. Um, and when we talk about transformed cells, we're talking about cells that uh, differ from normal cells um, because those cells are not controlled by normal growth death processes. And we talk about um, transformation or transform cells a lot of the times when we talk about cell culture. So remember our cells that we worked with in the lab that were in a dish in the plates of the, the wells? Those were transformed cells. They grew indefinitely. They were not controlled by normal growth or death processes. Um, and that process of transformation is going to occur because of some mutations or a viral infection in that cell. But not every mutation in every viral infection by definition leads to transformation. It's only those that influence um, normal growth and death processes. Oftentimes, for a cell to become a transformed cell, it doesn't require one change, one mutation, because it turns out we've got a lot of things sort of protecting us from this happening. We've got a lot of redundancies, multiple layers that are sort of keeping cells um, in balance. Typically, for a cell to become transformed, to no longer be controlled by normal growth and death processes, this cell has to have multiple changes happen. This is known as the multi-hit hypothesis. So here you can see a cell um, that might um, undergo a mutation. Um, you can see that some of its relatives that are also progeny of the same original cell won't have that mutation. And that might change the cell a little bit, but not too much. But then additional mutations might occur. And we'll actually see our problematic cell when we've had multiple changes happen to our um, cells in order to kind of get rid of those redundant controls on the cell. On the right, you're seeing another version of this where you can see that in reality, um, sometimes our cells will um, see kind of the same pathways get hit in those multiple hits, even if they're not necessarily always in the same order or things like that. But in order to get any particular um, cancer, we've got to have multiple hits happening. One of the reasons why that is going to become, or a bunch of reasons why that's going to become really important as we talk about cancer immunology, but one reason why that is really important is that in two individuals, even if they have the same exact type of cancer, the cells probably didn't get the same exact hits. They pro every and so everybody's cancer is a little bit different. Maybe everybody's cancer has 10 mutations, but the exact 10 that got you to a cell that was out of control might be a little bit different. So everyone's cancer is slightly unique. Um, you can see sort of this aspect of the multi-hit hypothesis here as well, um, where again, we might have one cell that has a mutation. Maybe it's a little more susceptible to certain other issues. So sometimes some of those early mutations are in like repair processes, so it's easier to pick up mutations. Um, and eventually you get sort of this change cell, we'll have a few progeny, maybe one of them will get changed and have a few extra progeny, and so on. When we think about cancer in a person or in an animal, we are actually thinking about a process known as oncogenesis. Transformation, these changes to a cell that we've been talking about, are changes that happen in cell culture. Our cell goes from being a nice, normal, happy cell, and it transforms into being a sad, 
problem cell. Um, but in order to actually then cause issues in a person, some additional changes need to happen. Sometimes people will call um, immortal cell lines like we worked with in lab this year, cancer in a dish. Um, and yeah, they were actually tumor cells that came from a person. But if I injected them into you, they would actually not cause cancer because they couldn't do all of these steps for oncogenesis in you. Um, and so there are some additional steps that those cells need to have in order to really lead to um, a tumor or really be a cancer cell um, in an organism. So as you can see here, a transformed cell is not necessarily oncogenic. Classically, with cancer biology, um, and I will come back to this, um, we think about there having to be six different things that the cell has to do, the six hallmarks of cancer. Um, I'm going to talk about the six hallmarks of cancer. They're like super important. I will also tell you that the person who described them, I believe, is actually up to 12 hallmarks now. Um, we're going to just stick with the six. Your textbook mostly sticks with the six. And so those six are shown here as kind of the original six, which is that the cells have to stimulate their own growth. Um, sometimes that even means they have to do things like make cytokines to help themselves, make their own cytokines to feed themselves. They have to ignore growth inhibiting signals. They have to avoid apoptosis. They have to actually develop a blood supply so that the tumor can get nutrients. Um, they need to be able to travel around the body to metastasize, and they need to be able to undergo constant replication. Um, so some of this information about general cancer biology is going to be things that you need to kind of remember when you think about, um, when we think about cancer immunology. So there's one other thing I want to briefly mention about general cancer biology before I kind of pivot into thinking about immunology. And that is about some of the things that tend to cause cancer. One thing that could lead to some of those hits, some of those mutations, will be some kind of environmental or lifestyle factor, exposure to some kind of mutagen. Um, that can be lots of different things in your environment that may lead to um, some kind of mutations. There are also some viruses that are known to transform cells and lead to cancers. Um, and so these are two sort of things to be aware of is that we often can think of kind of general genetics factors or you getting a mutation from whatever thing happens in your life or from some viruses. But this leads us to thinking about the question of, hi, Dr. Barker, this is an immunology class. Why are we talking about this in immunology? Why do immunologists care about cancer? Um, I find this to be a particularly interesting and important question. If you look at your textbook, your textbook has a chapter on cancer immunology. If you look at most immunology textbooks, there's the lovely chapter of cancer immunology. That's great. Um, if you looked at textbooks when I was a student, you would not have found a chapter on cancer immunology. And if you talked to some of my professors, one in particular I'm sort of quoting here, when I was in graduate school, one of my professors said cancer immunology didn't exist when I was in graduate school. Cancer immunology has not always been something that every immunologist is totally on board with. There was a bunch of time where people did not think that cancer immunology was a huge thing. 
now we talk about it all the time and it make people make billions of dollars and people's lives are saved and it's amazing and your textbook is like of course it's a thing here's a chapter but i do want to point out in a couple of places places where immunologists in the past have had some questions about things that we're talking about because i want to highlight a couple of sort of bumps in the field that i want you to see um, or sort of some issues with all of this that I want you to see. And so if we imagine that that professor of mine was in the room, he would say, well, why do immunologists care about cancer? Why are you teaching your students about this in your immunology class? And there would be some really simple reasons and some more complicated reasons. Um, one really simple reason is because sometimes pathogens cause cancer. <laughs> this table from your textbook shows a bunch of different viruses that can sometimes cause different types of cancers. So one reason why immunologists care about cancer is because we think a lot about how our body is defending against pathogens, and some of the pathogens cause cancer. So that's a pretty obvious reason. So the fact that some viruses cause cancer, pretty key. Then we can also think a little bit about it in another way. When we treat many types of cancers, this table from your textbook on the right shows some such cancers. We use radiation and chemo as sort of classic cancer therapies. And radiation and chemo have some really great <laughs> pros and also some, some big cons. Some of these are going to sound similar to stuff we talked about when we talked about therapies for other immune-related diseases. One of the big cons of radiation and chemo is that they are not super specific. They kill rapidly dividing cells. That includes the cancer cells. It also includes some stem cells that are involved in hair growth. So many patients' hair falls out. They involve some stem cells in the GI tract, so patients have some uh, GI issues. And they also include all of the cells of the immune system. So we often need to treat our patients with bone marrow transplants to regrow their immune system. Um, and so when we treat patients with cancer, we're messing with their immune systems. So that's another reason why we could say, well, immunologists probably should care about this because if we're gonna treat these diseases, we're gonna mess up the immune system. And a final simple answer to why immunologists care about cancer is that if we look at the immune system, particularly at lymphocytes, we see that there are a disproportionate number of cancers of lymphocytes. So sometimes you have a cancer of the immune system. Your lymphocytes get messed up. That often happens because of problems with VDJ recombination, where we are breaking and pasting DNA. And so we're having these translocations where the DNA is actually messed up. And this, way back from the B cell development chapter, is a table that shows all sorts of different types of B cell cancers and how they're defined based on which step of B-cell development involves the B-cell getting messed up. So because B and T-cells are breaking DNA as part of their life and part of being a B-cell and a T-cell, they are somewhat predisposed to cancer. So that's a pretty good reason why immunologists should, cause, should think about cancer, because like our cells do it. But we can also think a little bit about sort of the, uh, another side of this. And again, we'll remember my professor who argued against uh, cancer immunology. 
So he would be like, all right, yeah, 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 fine. But let's imagine a lung cancer that was resulting from mutations, result from smoking. Let's imagine a breast cancer that comes from mutations that are partially hereditary and partially from mutagens. No virus, not an immune cell, none of those things. Does an immunologist care about any, any of those? Is there anything going on with the immune system and those totally genetic, totally non-viral, totally not immune cell types of cancers? And the field has realized the answer to that is yes in two different directions. There's sort of the main direction of most of what I wanted to tell you about today, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. There's also one other kind of side branch that is becoming a bigger deal in the field of late. I have a couple of slides on that side branch. I didn't really know have a great place where to put them. So we're going to do that side branch for a little bit, and then we're going to go down the main branch <laughs> um, now. And so one thing that we have realized is that there's a major role for inflammation in cancer. Um, when we have an inflammatory response, when we have some sort of innate immune PRR signal, we're going to you know, do great things like stimulate our innate immune response. We're going to get some cytokines. We're going to get some inflammation. And we're also going to try to repair this tissue. And when we repair the tissue, we're going to have to have some proliferation and wound healing and things bringing us back to homeostasis. It turns out that this inflammation process pushes a little bit of proliferation. It's basically like, hey, cells, divide so we can heal this, the area. And so the hope is we have some inflammation and we can maybe regenerate our normal tissue, possibly including things like proliferation. Well, if we end up with way too much proliferation, if we end up with way too much inflammation, we can tell those cells, divide, 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 divide. No, keep dividing, keep dividing, more dividing, all the dividing. And we can actually start to push not towards wound healing, but towards excess inflammation, excess proliferation, and potentially towards a tumor. And so we have realized that tumor progression may have some inflammation um, underlying it as it involves sort of the immune system telling certain cells, hey, proliferate more, please, in order to heal the wound, but perhaps do too much proliferation. And so this is sort of a newer area that a lot you can see these are from papers from 2019 where people are realizing, oh yeah, there should be um, a whole bunch going on with inflammation and cancer. And in fact, one of the really hot areas is that it seems as though some of our PRRs can actually detect certain types of DNA changes. And so you can see a number of cases here where things like chromosomal instability may actually induce innate immune responses. Um, and there is kind of this innate immune side to this. And this is a very much a kind of new area for the field. The other area for the field is on the adaptive side. And that's really where I'm going to go today is on thinking about this adaptive piece. And again, we are largely going to think about this adaptive piece and you know some genetic mutation-driven, non-viral, non-lymphocyte kind of cancer. You can pick whatever kind you want. The kind that my professor in grad school would say, no. The immune system is not involved in this. And before 
I tell you, um, why sort of what uh, data I want to tell you about here, I want to ask you an important question. So let's imagine we think back to that professor who says, no, the immune system does nothing, particularly we're talking about adaptive responses against these cancers. Why would he say that? What's the big issue with having an immune response to that genetic, non-viral, mutation-driven cancer. There's a major problem here, and there's a place where this kind of comes in contrast with a lot of what we talked about the rest of the semester. Yeah. Uh, self yeah, that's a self-cell. We spent all this time recently talking about how you, know, you don't have responses to self cells. We have all these tolerance mechanisms so that you don't have autoimmunity. And now we want to get rid of self cells. The whole point of immunology all semester has been dealing with non-self cells. And now we're talking about we're getting rid of self cells. And so he said, no, there's absolutely no way that you, your, your immune system can't like go up to a cell and be like, what is your intention? and find out that it's a problem cell. It's a problem self-cell. And so that was sort of the idea for a really long time, was that cancer was not at all going to be something that the immune system was going to deal with, because it's self-cells. And our whole point is to not deal with self-cells. But there were a number of observations that people made that made them start to question that. I'm going to actually give you one observation that is more on that other professor's side before I give you some of these observations. Um, and so this observation is actually shown on the left of this slide. From your textbook, you can see um, some information about um, a tumor um, as well as how many times the population has doubled and sort of the size of the tumor in millimeters. And we can see different things going on with the patient. The tumor first being visible in an x-ray, the tumor first being sort of noticeable, palpable, if this is a breast cancer, for example, versus death of the patient. When the tumor was first visible on x-ray, there were 10 to the 8th or 100 million cells. When that tumor was first palpable, there were 10 to the 9th, or 1 billion cells. When the patient died, there were 10 to the 12th, or 1 trillion cells. If you think about how many times that original cell had to divide to get to a trillion cells, or a hundred million or a billion cells, that probably took a while, right? That took years and years and years, most likely for enough cell divisions to get from one cell that had all these hits to these huge numbers, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 12th. And if we actually look at patients, we tend to see most patients with cancers are actually showing up with their cancers when they're older ages, partially because it just takes a long time for the cells to divide that many times, right? And so you'd say, oh my gosh, so this is happening over years and years and years. Like, the immune system isn't going to be doing, like, what? No, the immune system is not going to let something go for 20 years. <laughs> like, this just doesn't seem to sort of work. And so a lot of immunologists looked at data like this, as well as the fact that they were self-cells, and were like, not our thing. Not part of our field. However, whenever you looked at tumor tissues under a microscope, here you're seeing a breast cancer as well as a skin cancer you always saw that the tumor was full of lymphocytes. And so not only could you find tumor cells really easily, you could find tons of lymphocytes that had gone into the area. 
as if the lymphocytes were trying to do something. And so that might, that's made some immunologists think there's something going on here with the immune response and these tumors because we find lymphocytes. Some immunologists studied certain types of mice, either skid mice or nude mice, that were missing different parts of their adaptive immune response. So these are mice that are missing adaptive immune responses. And what I mean, these immunologists observed was that if you took those mice and you just kind of left them in the mouse facility. You like forgot that you had them and let them just sit for a long time. They always got nasty tumors. So it seemed like these mice who didn't have adaptive immune responses always got tumors as they got older. And so again, it was like, huh, it's almost like there's something going on with the adaptive immune system in cancer. During the HIV epidemic, we, um, and HIV, of course, is causing immunodeficiency in many patients, there are lots of different infections that HIV patients suffer from. But HIV patients also suffer from a lot of cancers, some of which are viral. And you're like, yeah, no, not a shock. But some of them, like this primary lymphoma of the brain, is not a viral cancer. And so again, you're like, these patients don't have adaptive immune responses and they keep getting cancers. There's something going on with adaptive immune responses and cancers. Even though it seems super weird, because these are self cells. This is a process that's happening over super long periods of time. Like this, it, it did not make sense to people for a really long time. You can see why my professor was like, no, I don't believe it, no. Um, but some immunologists went ahead and did some experiments. This is one type of experiment. The next slide shows you another type of experiment. And they did things like take tumor cells and irradiate them so those cells could no longer divide. And they could take those cells, those irradiated tumor cells, and inject them into a mouse. And then if they tried to give the mouse the same tumor, a viable version, a non-killed version of the tumor, the mouse didn't get cancer. It was as if you had vaccinated the mouse against cancer or immunized the mouse against cancer. You had induced this mouse to make an adaptive immune response that protected it from uh, this tumor. And it was a specific response, because if you tried to give the mouse a different tumor, that tumor still grew. So again, it was like, OK, so there's something up with the adaptive immune response and protection against cancer. Um, you could see the same thing here. We can take a mouse and get rid of that mouse's cancer uh, surgically. And then we can try to put the same tumor back in and it won't grow. It's like the mouse has become immune to its cancer. We can also um, transfer t CD8 T cells, and those will block the tumor. So what even seems like CD8 T cells seem to be important for this protection. Oh my gosh. So we see all of these data, and we see this: there is something going on with an adaptive immune response to cancer. And we still see that, and we know that today, that in fact, we do see adaptive immune responses to tumors through a process that I will show you about in a couple of slides. Um, it is a three-step process. Um, the individual three steps are really important. We're going to get into those three steps. Before we get into those three steps, I want to point out one other piece to this. Because this other piece, I think, sometimes when I read some stuff about cancer immunology, people are like, yeah, 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 no big deal. And I'm like, um, actually, that's like a huge deal. Why, why are we pretending this is no big deal? Whoa, 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 folks. <laughs> so let's I want to put it up on the table <laughs> before we get into like classic cancer immunology. 
So this experiment, the experiment on the slide before, indicates that we can, in fact, make an adaptive immune response to cancer. There is some kind of adaptive immune response happening. Um, from some of those other observations, we can see if you don't have an adaptive immune response, you're maybe predisposed to cancers. So there's something up with the making an adaptive immune response to cancer. But there's a problem with this idea of making an adaptive immune response to cancer. What's the problem? Yeah, Jay. It's still a self-cell. It hasn't stopped being self-cell. So somehow we're still invoking this idea that we're responding to a self-cell and killing a self-cell. Somehow there still has to be an antigen to induce this adaptive immune response. So I want to talk a little bit about what we know about the antigens before I talk about the process in general. And we understand now three major types of tumor antigens as being parts of this process. Um, some of those are called TSAs, or tumor-specific antigens. Some of them are called TAAs, or tumor-associated antigens. A tumor-specific antigen is going to only be found in that tumor. And in fact, honestly, it's going to be found in your tumor. Remember how I mentioned that everybody's tumor is a little bit different? The TSA is going to be found in your tumor. It's your specific tumor antigen. TAAs are found, they are associated with tumors. They're found in some other situations as well, but they're maybe found more frequently in tumors or they're at higher levels in tumors. Um, TSAs are in some ways the easiest ones to understand. So a tumor specific antigen. Here is our normal cell at the top. And remember, when we talked about MHC class one, we talked about the fact that all nucleated cells are presenting peptides on MHC class one at all times. So normally, we're making ourselves peptides, we're presenting them to the T cell. We're like, hey, T cell, am I okay? And the T cell's like, not even noticing because the T cells that recognize those self peptides got killed, right? Well, when we have a mutation, that mutation is going to change the DNA, which will change the protein. And now, that protein that gets presented, see, it's red instead of purple. Um, that protein is now a different peptide, a different protein that's getting presented. So now, our original self-peptide is not the same. We actually have a novel peptide being presented to the T cell, not a peptide that the T cell was originally selected against in the thymus. And so you can think this is a new foreign protein, a new protein that the T cell was not selected against. And so we're going to make an immune response against this mutated, um, or against this changed protein that came from the mutation in the DNA. And that would be a tumor-specific antigen. And so this is going to be related to exactly which mutation happened in you, in your tumor. We also find that there are some proteins whose expression level changes. So normally, you make one transcript <laughs> of this purple protein. See, the normal cell makes one. Sometimes in a cancer cell, you might make too much of some kind of protein. That will change how much of it is presented by MHC, and so you'll have overexpression of this normal protein. That overexpression is associated with a tumor. Um, this antigen is associated with the tumor, but there are still other cells. It's not totally specific to it. We also know that in our genome, we have you know, 20,000 genes. Each cell expresses a subset of them, the ones it needs. The I expresses the I ones. <laughs> 
the skin expresses the skin ones. There are some that are only expressed when you're an embryo to allow you to develop as an embryo and then you never express them and never use them again because you're no longer an embryo. When cells start to, uh, when cells are transformed, when cells are proliferating rapidly, sometimes they just randomly turn stuff on. And when they do that, they sometimes will randomly start turning on embryonic genes that shouldn't be on. And so sometimes we'll start turning on some of these embryonic genes and those can also serve as antigens um, that we did not originally select against. Um, and so this shows you some tumor antigens that we do know about. Some of them are viral. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But some of them are things like overexpressed proteins or proteins that are important to different differentiation stages. This is looking specifically at a num how many patients had levels of this fetal protein, alpha fetal protein. First, patients who don't have can liver cancers, like they have other liver diseases. Well, they don't have this turned on. Here's a whole bunch of non-cancers. Here's some non-cancers. But if you actually look at the liver cancers, you can see many of them turn back on this alpha fetal protein, and so that can serve as an antigen. Um, what you should realize here um, is that this is a lot of what is known about antigens in tumor immunology and cancer immunology. And so I th my feeling is that there are a few cases in the field where sometimes I'm like, guys, we're going a little too far here because you can't name an antigen. Um, and so note that with a lot of what I'm going to talk about going forward, thinking back on my, what the heck is the antigen, like it's not something I'm going to talk about and it's something that sometimes people blow past. This is what we know about, their, about possible antigens. But in a lot of cases, your tumor is going to have its own unique antigen or set of antigens. And that will actually become important with some of the stuff I talk about later. Um, so what we have learned is that in reality, the adaptive immune system responds to tumors, responds to these tumor antigens. And when we think about hallmarks of cancer, there are more than six. In fact, one thing that we now know about all cancers is that cancers have the ability to evade the adaptive immune response. So normally, in a normal day, if some cell is transformed, some cell starts to be problematic, the adaptive immune system is going to kill it. And one of the things that allows that transformed cell to actually be oncogenic is that that cell has to learn how to avoid this adaptive immune response. This is part of the reason why we think tumor progression takes such an incredibly long time in patients is because over time, these cells are starting to evade immune responses. And so in fact, this is what we actually think happens with um, cancer and the immune system. So at some point, we're going to have a cell that is going to have a problem. It's going to have a mutation. That cell is going to present its mutated peptide on the surface. And CD8 T cells or other cells are going to come in and they're going to eliminate it. You might have just right now made a first mutated tumor cell while you're sitting here. And a T cell might just come over and kill it. There, you had cancer for one minute. But the T cell stopped it. Everything's fine. You're all good. And so we think that one cell goes wrong pretty often. And that cell gets eliminated. And you're protected. 
because of this great work that your adaptive immune system is doing. And, but at some point, that cell maybe picks up another mutation. And that other mutation maybe helps it to avoid immune responses or helps it to maybe grow a little faster. So it's sort of now at an equilibrium with those immune cells. The immune cells are killing off the cancer cells as quickly as you're getting new ones. So the tumors arise, they get recognized. Eventually, one of these cells maybe picks up two mutations. Maybe this cell didn't get killed quite fast enough. Its progeny gets a second mutation. And so suddenly, you get another variant cell. And that variant cell is kind of going to be in equilibrium with the immune sy system. So there are going to be uh, some new cells forming but you're gonna be mostly keeping them under control. You're gonna sort of stay at this nice sort of homeostasis level where you've got a few problem cells, but most of them are going to be getting killed. What you can imagine is that those problem cells, those cells at equilibrium, are going to maybe keep varying. Their progeny might pick up some additional variations. We're going to get a lot more different types of these tumor cells. And eventually, one of those cells is going to succeed. It's going to somehow pick up a mutation that allows them, that allows it to completely avoid and completely escape the immune response. And so now that tumor is going to escape immune control eventually one variant may escape the killing mechanism. Um, and so suddenly we're going to have this cell start to um, really escape from immune control and start to divide um, sort of uncontrollably. And so what we think is actually happening is that you are very frequently getting almost like these micro tumors that your adaptive immune system is killing and only if one of those escapes the ability of the adaptive immune system to kill it, do you actually get to the point where we see that tumor and we can diagnose that tumor. And so this ability of um, cells to evade the immune response is now known as one of the hallmarks of a tumor cell. And in fact, if I were to take those cell lines we worked in, on in the lab and inject them into you, they would likely not cause cancer because they would not evade your immune system. And so we can also think about some of the ways that we have learned about tumor cells evading immune responses. One thing that we know about with many tumors is that here is an original tumor cell. So that men, and if that tumor cell, say, I don't know, presents its antigen a lot on MHC class one, that cell gets killed, right? Sometimes we'll get variants of that tumor cell that actually present, have less MHC class one on their surface and will reduce MHC class one production so that we can no longer recognize them with T cells. This figure from your textbook shows you, um, I don't remember which tissue it is, but it's a tissue, it's a tumor tissue from a patient. The brown staining is MHC class one. So what you should notice is even though, as we talked about before, all nucleated cells should be presenting MHC class one, much of that tissue is missing MHC class one. Because the tumor cell has been selected the, the only ones that lit, the ones that had lots of MHC got killed. Only the ones that happened to, lucky for them, pick up a mutation that reduced their MHC levels were able to survive. So there's sort of a natural selection for those cells that had less MHC class one. Um, sometimes what we will see is we'll actually see 
um, tumor cells that might make things like decoy proteins to say, NK cells, inhibit please. I don't want to turn you on. No, no, no. And so we can see things like NK um, blocking proteins being made to block NK cell activation. Here we can see loss of MHC again at the top. But we can also see that sometimes, remember how I said that tumor cells just start turning on random genes? Sometimes they luck out and the random gene they turn on is like growth factor. And then they're like, woohoo, now I can grow more because I learned how to make growth factor. Natural selection for me. Sometimes the random gene they turn on might be an immunosuppressive thing, like an immunosuppressive cytokine or an immunosuppressive molecule. So suddenly the tumor might be like, oh wait, I learned how to make TGF beta. If any adaptive immune cells come near me, I can turn them off. Natural selection for me. <laughs> um, and so we see that um, many of our tumors are going to make immunosuppressive proteins. Um, you can see this here on the left as well. And I will tell you that clinically, when we look at pretty much every diagnosable tumor in a patient, we find that that diagnosable tumor is immunosuppressing hardcore. Those tu tumors are making so many Treg cytokines, so many immunosuppressive molecules, that basically what has happened is the tumor has made a little area where it's like, nope, you can't see me. Sorry, no adaptive immune system allowed here. And that's one of the ways it has actually been able to escape. And so immunosuppression is a huge and common piece to this process, making a lot of types of tumor-induced immunosuppression. Um, some tu sometimes tumors will even start to induce the production of connective tissue and other physical barriers and turn themselves into an immune privilege site. Make a little, just make a little wall so that the adaptive immune cells can't come. Um, we also think that there may be a major role for T cell exhaustion um, in helping the immune, uh, the tumor evade immune responses. Because remember, we talked about the idea of if some antigen is leading to stimulation for years and years and years or really long periods of time, the T cells can undergo during persistent antigen, will have the T cell start losing its ability to act and be exhausted and eventually not be able to kill. And so maybe at the beginning when your tumor started, your T cells were doing a pretty good job. And then as time went on, the T cells were like, really, 20 years of this? And they got exhausted and could no longer kill that tumor that they could have at the beginning. Again, we all understand exhaustion at this part of the semester. Um, and so we are realizing there's this key role for the immune system or immune evasion as part of the process of cancer formation. But we can also think about this in another way, which is, OK, cool. Can we figure out a way to use what we know about immunology to try to combat cancer? And there are a couple of different parts of this as well. One of the things that we know is, well, uh, yeah, some of the types of cancers are caused by viruses. So we can deal with them like we deal with all the other viruses. <laughs> we can make a vaccine to vaccinate against the viruses that cause cancer. And that will get rid of one part of the problem. And so this actually shows you um, some information about the HPV vaccines that are protective against different strains of human papillomavirus that are causative agents of cervical cancers, um, genital warts, and a few other things. And as different generations of the HPV vaccine have come out, more and more cervical cancers have been preventable um, because we can use the immune system to stop these viruses. 
OK, cool. What about all the non-virus stuff? I told you that right now, or at least in the past, the key treatments we use for cancers were radiation and chemo. What was the problem with radiation and chemo? Yeah. Killed a lot of cells. It's really broad, right? We're killing the cancer cell, but a whole bunch of other cells too. Does this sound familiar at all? About things being too broad? Yeah, remember when we talked about autoimmunity treatments and allergy treatments? We started out with some treatments that were super broad, and I said that the field has been trying to narrow and narrow and narrow the treatment. We're trying to get our treatments to be more specific. We're trying to get specificity in our treatments. Specificity is the favorite word of adaptive immunology or adaptive immunity. That's like our whole system's point is specificity. So maybe we can use the specificity of the adaptive immune system to deal with cancers. So one idea that people came up with is to take different antibodies and actually put things like toxins on the FC portion, you know, chemicals like chemotherapy toxins, or put radioactive molecules on the FC portion and deliver those antibodies. So instead of giving chemo to the whole body and killing every cell, you're using the antibody to deliver the chemo just to the tumor cell. Or you're using the antibody to deliver the radioactivity or some other um, toxic molecule just to the tumor cell. Then you can get much more specific. You can stop a bunch of those side effects. You can stop that breath. You can be much safer. The problem here, of course, is you have to have an antigen. <laughs> you have to have an antigen that antibody binds to. And so this isn't going to work necessarily for everybody, but sometimes you're going to have an antigen that will be on the tumor, and you can kill those tumor cells more specifically. Um, we have, people have further realized you don't even have to do something this hard. You can just give people antibodies against <laughs> these antigens. They don't have to have fancy stuff on the FC portion. Just give people the antibodies against the tumor, and your immune system will do the rest. So here's an example of just giving some antibodies and getting NK cells to kill the tumors. Or many of the other types of antibody um, molecules to deal with the tumors. This table from your textbook shows a number of different situations where this happens. Um, so these are some conjugated antibodies where we're actually you know, binding the toxin or the radioactivity. These are just some antibodies that bind to particular molecules. So again, this works really well. Now we can actually try to just kill the tumor cell and not kill all the cells. But we got to think about what the heck is an antigen here. What antigens can we use? Yep, Car uh, Carmi. Um, isn't this just specific targeting one specific tumor? So this is going to be specific targeting one specific tumor, yes. So so this so this sort of gets exactly where I was going, which is that sometimes there are some cancers where there, there's a common antigen that we see. So for example, some breast cancers have this particular antigen we often see. And so what might happen is we might have a patient who has breast cancer, and we might do some genetics on some, we might take some cancer cells and do some testing and see, does that patient happen to have this antigen? And if so, then we can give them the antibody. And maybe it'll work. And if not, then we say, I'm sorry, ma'am. And I can't treat you with my antibody. I want to talk through. So these are some of the options. Um, so you can see, for example, there are a few different types of cancers that can be treated. I'm going to talk specifically about rituximab because um, rituximab is 
um, one that is particularly famous and important. Um, and with rituximab, what uh, we are treating um, types of lymphomas and leukemias, which are B cell tumors. The rituximab antibody is an antibody that binds to CD20, which is on all activated mature B cells. And so if we treat our patient with rituximab, this antibody will bind to those mature activated B cells and kill them. And kill the tumor. Hooray! And also kill all the other activated mature B cells. We've gotten more specific. We're not giving, we're not trying to kill all the cells. Now we're just trying to kill activated B cells. But you can see that this still isn't great because we're killing all your B cells. It saves you from the cancer, but it gives you this other sort of issue. And these are sort of, this is kind of some of the best case scenarios of what we can do. One of the other areas I'm that- I'm not sure I understand. Thanks, Siri. One of the other big areas that um, people have tried to think about is to realize that with every cancer, that cancer had some way of evading the immune system. Once upon a time, your immune system like, took care of it, and then it learned how to evade. So what if we can just kick that immune system back into gear and make it start recognizing again? Can we turn your immune system back on to deal with the tumor? The tumor is probably immunosuppressing. Can we get rid of the immunosuppression? and let your immune system just go back to doing its job? Because we know the adaptive immune system can do a great job. And there are a ton of different therapies that are Im sort of involved doing this. Um, not gonna have time to go through all of them in great detail, but just to hit some highlights. One thing, and again, Nobel Prize recently on this, is that we can use antibodies against either CTLA-4 or PD-1 so that we can never turn off T cells. So we can basically say, nope, no more T cell inhibition. T cells, if you were getting turned off before, this antibody is not gonna let you get turned off anymore. We're gonna keep the T cells on. These drugs have been revolutionary for cancer patients. You can also imagine they have some side effects of keeping all the T cells on all the time. But in theory, you only have to give the patient this for a short amount of time get rid of the can't allow the immune system to get rid of the cancer, then you can stop treating the patient. Um, and so you may have heard of Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. Um, like I said, revolutionizing treatment of a lot of patients. Um, there are a bunch of different types of therapies. This is me trying to summarize a whole lot of things in like one sentence, um, where we actually take T cells out of the patient and turn them on in the lab in a culture plate and then put them back into the patient. And so we basically try to wake the T cells up in the lab and put them back into the patient. Um, to do this, um, we might, we're going to need to do it individually for each person. So I'm gonna need to take your T cells, activate your T cells in the lab. There are some versions where I try to um, actually figure out what is your tumor antigen and prime the T cells against that antigen. I'm going to have to do that individually for each of you because you each are going to have a different tumor. And so you can imagine sort of the healthcare costs and some of the difficulties in that and whether or not that might be possible for everyone. Um, the most famous of these therapies is called CAR or chimeric antigen receptor therapy. And so what happens with CAR cancer therapy is that the patients, um, we take out the patient's T cells, and then we actually put in a new receptor that we made in the lab, the chimeric antigen receptor. And this receptor is completely made up in the lab. It has some parts that are the variable region from a B cell that responds to the tumor. And some parts that have abilities to do CD8 signaling and some parts to do some other signaling. This is actually a 
current view of a car receptor. So you can see we can actually have this one kind of Franken receptor. It binds to the antigen that we want. Doesn't need MHC. Signals through, like it's CD28. Signals like it's signal 3. Signals like it's CD3. Signals through all these things. Basically gives us all of T cell signaling off of this one receptor that we've chimerically put together. And so what we do is we take cells out of our patient. We put this receptor into the cells with genetic engineering. And we put this back into the patient. This is actually a picture of the first little girl who this happened with. Um, she's much older now. You can find all sorts of information about her online. Um, but her leukemia was cured with this. Um, her car was a get, it's listed here as an anti-CD19. Um, it's rituximab. Basically, she has a receptor that, killed, that gave her these T cells that killed all her B cells. Got rid of her tumor. She lived. She's, a, she's probably a little younger than you guys, but close to your age now. Um, and it's great, but this is, you can see, uh, you know, still not ideal in specificity. Um, in, this was listed as the first ever gene therapy approved by the FDA in the US. It was approved in 2017. Um, please note that this is from the American Society of Hematology. It costs a million dollars to des design this for one person. Um, and so any one person you'd uh, do this for, you'd have to design it for. And there are uh, future, uh, future generations of CAR therapies as well. Though again, there are pros and cons because for many of these cancer therapies, we are going to have to deal with them for your personal antigen, for your personal tumor. Um, I will see you guys in lab tomorrow. Um, hope that you have a great day. And as always, email me if you have any questions.